This is an image um, from a painting that the War Memorial has. Um, through this, I'll read some, I'll read some stuff and, and other things I will actually just add lib because I, I usually talk to the photos. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, European settlement brought about a, pra uh, a protracted and undeclared war against Australia's indigenous inhabitants with localised fighting following settlement across the continent and continuing in remote areas of central and western Australia until the 1930s. British soldiers rarely became involved against the native population, notably in Tasmania between 1828 and 1832 and in New South Wales in the mid 1920s and the late uh, sorry, 1820s and the late 1830s. The military usually did not regard Aborigines as a threat that warranted committed military forces to pursue them. Most of the fighting against the Aboriginal population was done by the settlers and by the police. Occasionally, Aborigines, Aboriginals attacked European settlers in open country. These encounters were usually won by the Europeans. Um, the Indigenous population was, however, more successful when they used stealth and ambush. Um, one of the things I always tell people too, at this time, no state homegrown militia or rifle corps ever fought against the Indigenous population of this country. Which, So we're not like the Americans where the, the cavalry fight the Indians. We never did that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there's um, always today that in, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population um, are very wary about police because the police were the enemy at one stage. Once the British, British units um, had left Australia and we were basically, the states then were forming their own defence force units, um, we started to send people before Federation to say the Boer War, the Sudan, um, we don't know of any um, Indigenous Australians who served in the Boer War or the Sudan. Um, though we do have, we know of several members who did join the pre-federation ser uh, services in the states of Australia. Um, on the left-hand side, the photograph of the, of, the, of the man in the uniform of the New South Wales um, Infantry, circa 1890, is a guy by the name of Jerome Locke. Um, Jerome Locke is quite an interesting man. The Locke family is actually quite a large family in, in known in New South Wales, especially around um, Penrith area for military service. Um, Jerome, when the outbreak, when the First World War um, broke out, Jerome decided to join the, um, the uh, first AIF and he got in to the first AIF. He lied about his age actually, because he was quite old. Um, and he went overseas and he was serving overseas for about, oh, about 15 months. And then they caught him and found out how old he was and they sent him back to Australia. Then he decided when he got back to Australia, he lied about his age and joined again. Um, they caught him again, but they let him stay in the AIF, but he wasn't allowed to serve outside of Australia. And he had actually two sons who served as well. Um, both was served overseas. One, was, um, the eldest son was wounded um, and I think he was taken prisoner but survived the war and his younger son um, arrived in France on Armistice Day, so he was a lucky boy. The a right hand photograph, you see the young Aboriginal boy down there holding like a little bucket. That's the tot, the tot, um, tot, rum tot jar, um, and they're mixing the rum tot for those sailors. Now, his name's Thomas Bungaline. His last name's a play on his traditional people. Um, the Kurnai people, he was, him and his brother, younger brother were taken from the traditional group and they were put into a non-Indigenous family in Melbourne thinking that that, that would be a way to give them an education and, and to help them in life. His father actually was a member of the um, Victorian um, Native Mounted Police. He was indentured on board um, Her Majesty's colonial steamship Victoria in 1861. And, um, he was thought to be a quite, a quite a, an intelligent young man. Um, they, they thought he, he, would, he would go places as a young Indigenous man. Unfortunately, he died at the age of 18. Um, and this, this is in the early 1860s. He died at the age of 18, uh, 18 of a broken heart because his younger brother had also died at the same, uh, a few years before. So um, 
they're both buried together in um, cemetery in Melbourne. But I mean, these are not the only ones that we know of who served in the um, early pre-Federation Defence Forces of the States. Um, surprisingly, before the Defence Act of 19, 1903, it was not uncommon for Indigenous, soul, uh, indigenous people to serve in the Defence Force. If you talk about the Boer War, there were supposed to be at least 50 um, Indigenous men sent to the to the Boer War, and there's a story going around that they were left there because they were they, they were black, and after after the um, the white Australia policy came in, they weren't allowed into Australia. That's untrue. It stems from a Kitchener telegram. He sent a telegram to all the um, colonial countries around the world when the Boer War was on, basically asking each each uh, each Commonwealth country, can you send 50 men who can live off the land, who can be good trackers, who can be, um, um, we need them to fight the Boers. And the, and the operative word was tracker. Everybody reads that word tracker and thinks, oh, they're Indigenous Australians. No, they weren't. But there were at least a dozen that we know served in the Boer War, but they went over in units and they had service numbers. So they came back in their units with their service numbers. Um, there were four, Tracker, police trackers sent over from Queensland actually to the Bloemfontein police um, to work. But, but the war the Boer War was seen as a white man's war and it was seen not to, to try to not to involve outside forces. And I mean, if you wanted trackers in South Africa, why don't you just go and talk to the local South Africans? So um, there were men who were not allowed back into Australia after the Boer War um, due to the um, Immigration Restriction Act, Restriction Act. What you found too is a lot of people paid their own way over there to join units in South Africa. And then when the war had finished, they couldn't get back. So they applied to the Australian government. The Australian government said, you have to work off your eight pounds for the, the, for the fare to come back to Australia. What happened then was um, if you, you couldn't pay your fare back, they wouldn't let you out of South Africa, wouldn't let you come back. And also some men had married local indigenous women from South Africa and they were seen as men of low moral fibre and they wouldn't let them back into Australia either. So there is a, there is, there are stories about not letting people back in, but it's not about these so-called 50 Indigenous trackers that we left in South Africa. In 1903, um, after Federation, they wrote the, um, the Defence Act of 1903. And in the Defence Act of 1903, it states persons who are not substantially of European origin or descent of which the medical authorities appoint under the regulation shall not shall be well, the medical authorities shall be the judges to allow them in. So basically, if you are an Indigenous Australian, you're not required to serve um, in the Australian Defence Force unless the government requires it at some stage, and it's left up to the medical officer um, to basically um, make that decision. At the outbreak of the war, 1914, quite a few Aboriginal men put their hands up to join. And you probably, after Gallipoli, we, we do know that there were some uh, Indigenous men serving on Gallipoli, but after Gallipoli, when we needed manpower and people started to see the casualty, the casualty list coming to Australia, what happened was recruiters traveling around Australia to recruit, in, to recruit so soldiers basically turned a blind eye to Indigenous soldiers. They turned a blind eye to your colour. They didn't care. Um, and basically, when you then went to your depot to um, be trained, that's where you actually sat in front of a medical officer. And the unfortunate thing about medical officers at that time, if some were either racist and they went, no, no, don't get in. They were either sticklers for rules and went, no, I'm sorry, you can't get in. Or they were, um, or they just turned a blind eye. So men did get in from 1914 onwards. Later during the war, it's, um, they were starting to be a little bit worried about seeing more Indigenous faces in the AIF. So well, they, they basically said stop recruiting in 1916, which they tried to do. But again, people, most people didn't pay any attention to it. Um, and then in um, a military order in about 1917 said half caste may enlist in the Australian Imperial Forces, provided the uh, examining medical officers are satisf satisfied that one of the parents is of European origin. Now, the guy in the middle of this photo, <laughs> photo 
he joined in 1916 and his parents are not, one of them is definitely not of European origin. Um, so, I mean, these are the rules. The rules, the rules, they changed the rules to suit and um, we continue to serve through the First World War. We're, they're not really sure how many served. We've got over at the moment, nearly 1500 names for the First World War. No Torres Strait Islands, I, I think maybe one or two Torres Strait Islanders at that time. There was an act to at, the same, at, at this time too, where Torres Strait Islanders weren't, weren't seen as Australians in a sense. Now, we, you look at this young, this man and you think, why the hell would he want to join a defence force that's in a, from a country that he's in where he's not seen as a citizen in his own country and he has no rights? Um, the unfortunate thing is, we don't know, we didn't ask. Um, we left it too late to ask these people. Um, what we think some of the motivations were, were there was, well, it was an incentive of a wage. We got paid six shillings a day, six bob a day, which was more than what the average British soldier, I think, got six shillings a week. Um, so we were quite well paid. So there was a chance to send money home to your family. Um, and you have to think at these times too, if you're on a mission station, you actually weren't allowed to leave that station. So you've got men disappearing and going to other states to join up. Um, so here's a chance to make money. You send money home to your family. Unfortunately, whatever agency, um, uh, Indigenous agency, your um, state's regulated by, took your money. So they took your wages back. So you're fighting the war, sending money home. Your money's not going to your family. Your family's destitute. Then they take your children. So you come home from the war and find that you've got, you've, your family's destitute and your children have been split up. Yeah. There was probably another thought too that by serving overseas, they would be shown some form of equality at the end of the war. Unfortunately, after the war, the status quo went back to what it was. Mission upbringing, um, again, you know, um, there was a, people were injected with that thing about patriotism, you know, this, you do the right thing. Also, a lot of these men like him, he's probably one generation away from traditional. And as a traditional man, it is what you do. You protect country. Now, this is an interesting thing when you talk to Indigenous people. And I think um, um, it was said by, um, what's his name? Army officer in the Second World War. We'll get to him later. Uh, Red Saunders. Red Saunders. They asked Red Saunders and said, um, why, do you, why do you serve for, for a country that doesn't see you as a citizen? And he said, I'm not, I'm not fighting for the, for, the, for the King of England. I'm not fighting for, for the Prime Minister of Australia. I'm fighting for my country. So he, he puts the spin on it. He's fighting for country. He, you know, the rest of the word doesn't matter. It's an Indigenous thing. It's about my country. Though the Royal Australian Air Force was formed in 1921, we had, we know at least two members who served in the Australian Flying Corps. Um, and one I know definitely of a Queenslander and another one we're researching at the moment. Second World War comes along. We're still under the same immigration, uh, still under the same Defence Act of 1903. We still can't join. 1939, lots of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders rushed to join up. We're not even sure how many served in the Second World War, but we're looking at the possible. We're looking at the moment about three and a half, three hundred, three thousand five hundred in uniform. Um, we're looking at nearly a thousand Torres Strait Islanders, um, and we're probably looking at five thousand who served alongside in an auxiliary capacity, uh, and we'll get to them later. In 1940, the War Cabinet decided that an enlistment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders was neither necessary nor desirable for service in the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. However, it was recognised that there may be a need to, to, to depart from this principle to meet the specific needs of the various services. Air Force with the need for personnel for the Empire Training Scheme remained open to Indigenous recruits with them, giving, uh, with them serving in both ground and air crew positions. The RAAF looked at, looked at it and looked to the RAF for direction. And the RAF, I think, had a ruling where it said one in 50 members of the RAF could be sort of non-white. Non so if you were born in Jamaica or whatever and you lived in the UK, you could join up. So the RAAF basically ignored the ruling um, to not recruit Indigenous Australians, um, which I think is something that we in the Air Force should be you know, um, telling people about because 
that we were doing the right thing. I think, unfortunately, too, one of the reasons was, too, the loss of manpower in Bomber Command um, also um, necessitated the need for manpower. The group of guys that you see there um, are what looks called the Wangaratta Platoon. The Wangaratta Platoon were uh, men from um, Gadichimara men, but um, they're all from down around um, Lake Tyres in Victoria. They all joined in mass to um, fight for the country. Unfortunately, when they got to Wangaratta where they were training, their commanding officer put them together in a platoon. And when they'd finished their training, he refused to let them go to units. So he just kept them there as a show platoon. They all got a bit jack of it. And in the end went, um, we're all going home. If you're not going to let us fight, we're all going home. So they all just went home. Um, the army actually then went, oh, we've probably done the wrong thing. Um, and they honorably discharged them all though some of them rejoined again and went on to serve in second AIF units around Australia and overseas. Uh, when I mentioned about the 1,000 Torres Strait Islanders, um, at the or well, after we thought that the Australia was not going to be invaded, but we needed manpower to man um, the northern part of Australia, and we wanted to release manpower up to serve overseas, they looked at the Torres Strait Islands. So they formed what was called the Torres Strait Light Infantry Battalion. There were also men in a, um, a, a small unit called the Torres Strait Coastal Artillery and a, and, and a few Torres Strait Islanders joined um, army sm small ships and also American small ships. One of our first officers, Camarillo Abenago, was a Torres Strait Islander. He was actually an officer in US small ships. So over 800 Torres Strait Island men joined the Light Infantry Battalion. Um, their officers, sergeants and officers above were non-Indigenous. They were recruited not to serve in Australia, but to serve, I'm sorry, not to serve overseas, but to serve in Australia to release manpower up. Um, some of them, however, did serve in Mor Moroiki force in New Guinea, fighting the Japanese in New Guinea because of their, um, their kin ties and their ties across to that part of um, um, Papua New Guinea and they could move around the countryside like a local, so, so they were very good at COVID operational stuff. Um, Christine Arnu's um, grandfather was one of these men, uh, men. The unfortunate thing about them, even though they were in the second AIF proper, they were only paid a third of the wage because they thought, oh, being island people, they could live more frugally than non-Indigenous people. That didn't work, um, so they went on strike. It's the only army unit in the Australian history, history of the Australian Army that went on strike and got away with it. Um, and they actually got another third of their pay. And in 1985, those who were alive got their back, the other third back pay. The lower right hand picture is all those others who joined in an auxiliary capacity. There were literally thousands of these people running cattle stations, um, on mission stations. Um, they were, they, they were, they were. A labour force basically not doing anything. The unfortunate, and, and they've been treated very badly in Indigenous Australians prior to the Second World War. Though the army in the 30s had been using had been using Indigenous manpower in the north, um, but when the Second World War broke out, all three services then looked to these people and went, um, "We need your manpower. We need to release people up to serve overseas. So we want you people to come and work for us." So they actually then got a wage. It was the first time in their lives Australian, uh, Indigenous Australians in the North got paid. Um, they got paid, they got good medical um, services. Um, they, 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 were, they got recognition too from the three services for serving the country. And, they and their service changed the minds of non-Indigenous Australians who'd been sent to the North to the soldiers, who then went back to the Southern states with a different idea about who Indigenous Australians are. The service of Indigenous Australians during the Second World War in, in their war effort for the war effort is phenomenal and, and we, we never really hear about it. The Royal Australian Navy, not a lot known about the Royal Australian Navy, um, Indigenous wise, prior to the Second World War on HMAS Geranium, there were about um, 10, about a dozen um, men from Bathurst Island. Geranium was an oceanographic vessel, went around the top of Australia in the 20s. Um, chart doing chart work and these men were brought on board because of their their um, knowledge of the area um, they wore uniform but they were not in the navy proper the, it's during the second world war men men and women did join the navy and um who were indigenous 
But the Navy being a little bit more puckered than the other three services tended not to recruit Indigenous people. Um, and this is one of the things about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders too. If you tend to be fairer skinned like me, and I've got a pointy nose, I mean, I can get away with being another nationality. People think me as a Turk and whatever, you know, Southern European. Um, and a lot of Indigenous people would not say what their nationality was. So that also skews our, our perception of how many people serve because they just kept their mouths shut. And, and a lot of them said they were Maori or South African or they were Spanish. Believe it or not, there's heaps of Spaniards in the First World War or Indigenous. Um, and, and also, too, one of the things that skews the story is after Anzac Day, if you came from a, a mission or wherever, you weren't allowed to leave. So you didn't march on Anzac Day. Nobody saw black faces in the marches. They didn't join associations. Skews the public perception of our service. And that's one of the things we have to, to realise, too. We don't, we're all not really dark skinned. Um, we're, we're, we're all kinds of colours, shapes and sizes. So the Royal Australian Navy, um, these men, these, these, these men are what they call the Snake Bay Patrol. The Snake Bay Patrol was um, made up on Melville Island by a bloke by the name of Lieutenant Gribble, Royal Australian Navy Volunteer Reserve. Their job basically was coast watching. Um, they rescued down airmen. They patrolled the shores for washed up mines. Um, they helped find aircraft wrecks, captured Japanese um, shot down pilots, aircrew. Um, and some of these men went to um, Belleville Islands, went to um, Timor. They were delivered there in submarine to do COVID operations. Um, as you can see in the photo, they're wearing naval uniform, they're armed, but they're not in the Navy proper, which is the unfortunate thing. So if any of these got killed, they're not recognised as serving members. Um, HMAS Piri was attacked by a Japanese aircraft off the coast of Australia. Four people were killed on it, um, and two of them, I think, were Indigenous. If you look at the War Memorial on, in the cloisters, Piri only lists the non-Indigenous men who were killed, not, not the Indigenous ones. HMAS Matafili, which was an Australian naval ship, last ship, a Burns Phillips ship, last ship to leave um, Rabaul, um, it had an all-native crew. When it came back to Australia, they volunteered to a man to join the Royal Australian Navy. And, and then they put a non-Indigenous crew on it. Um, she was lost with all hands off the coast, northern coast of Australia. The 20 odd non-Indigenous members are on the cloisters at the War Memorial, the 20 odd non-Indigenous Islanders aren't. I mean, so there's, that's the unfortunate thing is, you know, if you, if you, you, you didn't have a service number, you vanished. These people did have numbers to get paid, but they weren't service numbers. Those Snake Bay Patrol um, in the 60s did get medals and did get a stipend from the government for their service. Now we're getting the Royal Australian Air Force. <clears throat> As I said before, the Royal Australian Air Force was more open to the service of Indigenous Australians than the other two services. With the threat of invasion imminent, it was necessary to keep the sea approaches open to Darwin and to supply the garrison there. It was necessary to build airfields to provide air cover over the shipping lanes and supply reconnaissance. By using the local population, isolated airstrips were built on Groot Eland, Millingimby and Emerald River Mission to cover the east of Darwin and at Port Keats and Drysdale River Mission to the west of Darwin and a field at Bathurst Island Mission to cover the area to the north and the northwest of Darwin. Darwin. Now, this is before the Americans came here. So, we thought Australia was going to be invaded before we stopped the Japanese across at Kokoda. Um, the government decided to draw a line across Australia and call it the Brisbane line. It went from Brisbane to Adelaide and they said anything above that line, the Japanese can have. But when that, when that we thought, oh, well, they're not going to invade now, now, but they are doing reconnaissance over Australia, that's when we started to build airfields. We started to, to, to um, patrol the north of Australia before the Americans basically arrived. And the people who built those airfields were all in Indigenous population in the north of Australia. You know, they built them, they supplied them, they maintained them. Um, they rescued downed airmen who came back and missed the airfields and crashed into the, into the desert. Um, the first two, uh, the first prisoner of war ever captured by Australian military was by two of these men from Bathurst Island. Um, I mean, it's quite a, quite an interesting um, part of history that a lot of people don't actually know about. Also, um, when they were going to build, when they put the Brisbane line, 
in place. There was a, a man named Donald Thompson who was an anthropologist prior to the World War and he'd worked in the 30s in the north of Australia and he spoke the language and he got to meet a lot of um, um, traditional elders up there and he was well respected. At the outbreak of the Second World War, he joined the Air Force, he became a squadron leader, Donald Thompson, originally working in the Pacific with um, Indigenous people. They brought him back to Australia to raise a 50-man force, um, which was which was called the Northern Territory Coastal Reconnaissance Unit, which became then the Northern Territory Special Reconnaissance Unit. And they were made up of 50 Indigenous men drawn from the groups across the north of Australia. And their job was to fight a guerrilla war against the Japanese if they were to invade. Um, they were going to fight with traditional weapons. They were, they were drawn from communities. So they were all going to go back and, and get their communities involved. Um, and luckily, it didn't happen. But they are the forerunners of North Force today. So in a sense, you, North Force really was founded by a member of the Royal Australian Air Force. But don't tell the Army that. Pilots. We're not really sure how many men and women were served in the um, RAAF, Indigenous men and women in the RAAF in the Second World War. Definitely a lot less than the Army. The Army's always been the traditional service, um, has been since the First World War. Til um, um, young members of the Defence Force, if they're Indigenous today, you talk to them about it and they will say, oh, there's always a tradition of service and it usually goes back through an army line. Though Air Force today is where um, we're changing that a little bit. Everybody knows Leonard Waters, on the right hand photograph. Um, he's a Gamilaroi man um, from Bumai in far north New South Wales. He joined the Air Force, he wanted to be a pilot, but he um, scholastically wasn't, well, they didn't think he was capable of it, but he came in as a mechanic um, because he'd had some mechanical background. Um, and through perseverance and study, he actually um, was selected for aircrew and became a pilot. Um, and, he, and he left the Air Force in 46 as a warrant officer. He flew in 78 Squadron um, out of Noom 4, Dutch New Guinea, Moratai and Tarakan, and he'd done 95 sorties by the time he'd left. When he left the Air Force, he wanted to start a regional airline in Queensland, wrote to the government, but never got anything back. So he went back to one of the jobs that he originally had before the war, sheep shearing. And that's what he did for the rest of his life. I had the pleasure of meeting him when he donated his um, flying helmet and goggles, which he's wearing right there, um, to the War Memorial. A lovely man. Unfortunately, he had an accident and died several months later. Um, yeah, really lovely man. David, squadron leader David Valentine Paul on the right. DFC, he was born in Moree. Um, the family then decided to move from Moree. Moree's, Moree, even today, Moree has a problem um, with some race problems. And that family thought that if you're a mixed family, you're probably best if you don't stay in Moree and you move somewhere else where people don't know your pedigree, your background. So the family moved to Sydney, uh, North Sydney. Um, he joined the, um, the RAAF in... Um, 1941, got his pilot twins in December 1941. He was a Baltimore bomber pilot and flew out of the Middle East. Most of his job was reconnaissance work over um, the Italian and the German installations in the Mediterranean. On his 95th operational sortie, he was shot down and crashed in the sea and was captured by the, the um, Germans and was put in a... Um, in, Starlag Luft III in Europe. While he was there, he learned that he'd, he'd actually won the DFC for his, his work um, in reconnaissance work. Um, he also um, won it as well too for when his aircraft crashed into the sea, it was um, burning the aircraft and one of his aircrew were, um, couldn't swim. I don't think he could swim and was badly injured. And he swam back through the flames to rescue him. Um, he was regarded by his fellow prisoners of war as, as a, quite an honourable and, and, and a really good guy. When in, uh, uh, at the end of the Second World War, he didn't leave the Air Force, he stayed in the reservist and um, he actually died at his desk as a squadron leader at RAF Richmond, RAF Base Richmond. Um, he had a heart attack. He also was a police detective sergeant, the New South Wales Police, and he also helped set up the New South Wales Police Air Wing. So he's a quite an interesting man as well. 
And these are just three other pilots. We've been working on pilot, at the moment we're working on a project to do um, a publication on Indigenous service in the Air Force in the Second World War, or Indigenous service in the Air Force. And we're also looking at um, doing small bios of people. And these are some of the pilots that have just popped up just recently in, in the last couple of years. Um, as you can see, as I said before, um, it's not about colour of skin. So you will find a lot of these guys are, you, you know, they didn't say at the time, but they got away with it. To the, the, the guy to the left is a bloke by the name of Colin Cook. He's from Moora in Western Australia. He flew Beauforts and Mosquitoes, but he never left Australia. He, as a good pilot, he actually stayed in Australia as an instructor uh, and was instructing in Beauforts and Mosquitoes. The guy in the middle, James Sinclair, um, he enlisted in 1941 and he served until 1948. He did his operational um, flying out of Moratai and Ballyhappen, um, mostly in um, Liberators, but he also flew Beauforts and Mosquitoes. And the flying officer, Royal Hill, Roy Hill's our only known pilot at the moment that we can actually say yes, um, who was a bomber command. Roy Hill from Bustleton in West Australia. He was a minor. Um, he had two, brother, two brothers who joined um, the Defence Force as well. So the family had one, one in the Air Force, one in the Navy and one in the Army. His brother in the Army died of disease fighting in Malaya. And his brother in the Navy um, was on HMAS Perth when it was sunk, was President of War of the Japanese, but he survived the war too. Um, his brother actually wrote a book called Wind Tracks Across the Water about his, um, his, his being captured as a POW. But th these are just people to give you an overview, of, an idea of where people come from, you know, who we are. Oh, there you go, back one. These two guys, Alex Taylor, he's the, the guy on the um, left. Alex was born in Charlotte Waters. He joined in 1943 in Adelaide uh, and was a flight rigger. Served mostly, well, served all his time in Australia, in the north of Australia. Um, he served for three years and then went back to, to his life at, Charlotte, at, at um, Charlotte Waters. The man on the right, that's Flight Sergeant Arnold Lockyer. Flight Sergeant Lockyer has a, a horrible story, actually. He was married, three kids. He was a um, um, flight engineer in Liberators. And he was shot down over the Salibis right at the end of the Second World War. Four men got out of the aircraft, parachuted out of the aircraft. One chute didn't open, he was killed. Three were captured by the Japanese. One of those resisted arrest by the Japanese by actually uh, taking a bayonet off one of the Japanese and tried to fight him off. Um, they, they killed him. And Lockyer and another warrant officer were captured and held um, in prison. The war actually finished. The war was over. Japan, Japan had surrendered. Five days after the war had surrendered, the Japanese took him and the other war officer out in the jungle, made them dig a hole, chloroformed them and threw them in the hole and buried them alive. Though one of them, the chloroform didn't work. We're not sure which one. Um, and they bashed him unconscious and they buried them both alive. Now, he died five days after the cessation of hostilities. He's probably the last RAF member to die at the hands of the Japanese. Um, probably the last Australian Defence Force member to die at the hands of the Japanese. Women in the WAF. 1941, when the, when the Women's Australian Auxiliary Air Force was formed, um, I mean, the, the Air Force had been lobbied to, to take in women. Um, to release manpower, so they did 1941. Um, the, the WAF was the biggest of all three services, Army, Navy and Air Force. Um, so we're starting to find quite a few, well, not a lot, but we're finding a few Indigenous women who, who join the Air Force. And I mean, this is a time now where women can, uh, you know, can join, can stick their hands up. Not so much, not so in the First World War. We only know two women in the First World War, one in a hospital in Sydney and one who actually joined the Canadian military forces as a nurse and fought with the Canadians. Her people were from Macara, New South Wales. But um, at the moment, this is what, what I'm working on. It's, it's the women, so I've got a little bit more on women. Um, 
To the left is Dorothy Saunders, me Banfield. Um, she joined up as a cook's assistant. Dorothy um, is the wife of Reg Saunders, the captain in the Australian Army, first Australian, well, supposedly the first Australian Army officer, but he wasn't. We had some in the First World War. Um, and she originally was to marry his brother, but his brother was killed on the Kokoda um, trail. Um, so yeah, Dorothy, and then she left the Air Force when she got married. In the middle is Alice Lovett. Alice Lovett, again, um, she didn't leave Australia. Most, most of these women did not leave Australia for their service, they served in country. Um, Alice Lovett, she's a Victorian, she joined up in Victoria. The Lovett family, she comes from a long line of serving members. The Lovetts today are a huge family of serving members. They still have members serving the Defence Force. Um, Lovett Towers in Woden, which is, used to be the head of headquarters for Vets Affairs, is actually named after the Lovetts because of their service. Um, but they have a family of 20, 30 members. And they're not the largest family they were thought to have been, but they're not the largest family with Indigenous members within the Defence Force. And the woman on the right, um, that's Ivy Bell. Ivy Bell from, comes from Marino in Western Australia. Um, she joined up as a, as, as, a, as a cook and she joined up quite early. She joined in 1941. So Sergeant Bell, she, she was one of the early members of the, uh, the WAF. Um, she went on to um, serve until 1947 um, in the WAF. And these are just a few more. No, on the left again, Norma Fetter, Moonta from Moonta Mines, West Australia, um, Ruby Harris in the middle, um, another West Australian, Linda Lester, Linda Lester, who's on the right top row. She has an interesting career because she she um, was born in Granite Downs um, and she had three brothers and, and sisters and she was raised at a place called um, Coldbrook Home for Aboriginal Children in South Australia. She joined the WAF in 1945, um, the RAF, WAF in 1945. Um, she listed her sister Nellie as her next of kin. Interesting, after the war, she, well, she, she joined as a sick birth attendant, but then became a nurse's assistant or whatever it was by the end of the Second World War. After the Second World War, she worked at um, Heidelberg Repatriation Hospital in Melbourne with her sister. Um, her sister was the first Indigenous registered nurse in Victoria. Um, so they were both into, into nursing. Interesting thing, Linda married an ex-soldier who worked at the Repat and her sister married his brother. So the two sisters married two brothers. So, she, yeah, she has an interesting history. The bottom left hand, her name's um, Valma Wietra. She's another cook's assistant. She joined early, uh, um, late in the war. But anyway, that's just to give you an overview of women's service. The, the, th the thing with the women at this time is the, the jobs that they hold in Air Force are not the jobs that you see women in Air Force today. There are no engineers, there are no pilots, there are, you know, I mean, they're all really in those domestic, domestic type jobs. They're cooks, cook stewards, um, medical aides, um, stewardesses. Um, there are some um, or aircraft hands, general hands, you know, and that's and that's about it. Whereas Air Force totally changed how it does business today. Now, post forty five, post forty five, um, we weren't allowed to serve in the Defence Force legally until nineteen forty nine. Um, the Korean War comes along, we, you know, men are joining up. We don't know how many um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islands are in the Air Force in. Uh, the Korean War. We're looking at 30 to 50 around that area at the moment, possible, but I've only got names of about four or five that I'm working on at the moment. Um, the big picture at the, at the top, which is the cricket team, um, the guy third from the left back row, he's um, Corporal Vince Bunder. Vince Bunder's from, um, was born in Sherberg in Queensland. Sherberg's near Mergen, the town of Mergen. Sherberg was a big mission in uh, Queensland where they pulled people from all over Queensland and put them in Sherberg. He actually has an interesting career. He joined the army during the Second World War, served overseas in the second AIF. After the Second World War, he joins the Air Force as a carpenter um, and um, serves in Korea um, um, on, in, in, doing base maintenance. The guy at top right-hand side, Billy Hazel, William Hazel, he was an adgy. Um, 
He did two tours in Vietnam, the first one with Two Squadron um, as, as an Aggie. And then he was asked, did he want to stay? So he did a second tour as a door gunner in Nine Squadron. Interesting man. Um, I've met his daughter. Um, we had a march, we led the march in 2017, I think, in Canberra for all the Indigenous servicemen led the, led the march. And I, I met his daughter there. She proudly wore his medals. And the bottom one, the bottom photo is um, Corporal Edgar Lockyer. He's related to the Lockyer that I mentioned before, but he joined the Air Force after the Second World War and served in Malaya. The Lockyer family, um, I should mention too, in the Second World War, I think there were three other brothers in the army and I think one or two of them were killed in the Second World War as well. Why do we serve? You know, if people ask us, why do we serve? You know, there's still not equality in this country with Indigenous people. Um, I tell people in some ways it's to serve in the Defence Force is a bit like traditional life. It's tribal. We have three tribal groups, Army, Navy and Air Force. Each one's clan based. There's clans, you know, so there's air crew, there's ground crews, there, there's edges, there's, there's, you know, artillery, submariners, whatever, depends what service you're in. We have totemic symbols. We have flags, banners, guidons. We wear badges. We wear things that, that make us stand out. They're totemic. And the ethic is really similar, where we look after each other, we share, no one's better than anybody else. We don't leave anybody behind. We look after each other. And it's a comfortable place, I think, for Indigenous Australians, because if they've come from a, a, a traditional or close to that kind of life, well, you know, prior to their service, it, that you kind of slide in and you fit in. And Air Force seems, I think, to be doing it the right way at the moment, because we tend to keep our service members. Air Force looks at it, we're looking at it from a different way of the thinking and we're, we're, I think we're doing it right. Uh, this, this, is the, this is at ATG Operation Okra. The two, the two guys on the ends are cousins. They were Radry men, um, leading aircraft from Brent Irvine and Jackson Sadler is his cousin. And in the middle is um, Flight Sergeant Luke Walker, um, all three Indigenous guys. That's the end of the talk. If you've got any questions, um, I'm happy to fend off questions. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, that was terrific. Um, one question I had that came out of it, well, there's a couple of observations. I think that, that you were saying what you were saying about um, why, what would be the motivation to join? I think, you know, pay, pretty common to a lot of us, isn't it? Um, the, the, uh, yeah. To get away, you know, to, to um, protect country, a very common thing. But of course, you know, leaving the war, leaving leaving the services after after say the, the first or the second world war, uh, most people would step out with a sense of um, equality and recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think probably one of the saddest things you were saying about about you know was, there was no indigenous faces in Anzac Day marches following first and second world war. People went back to their missions and they they weren't allowed to leave. And they're really really sad. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the question that I had was, when the court, I love what you were saying about um, uh, about a lot of people. Obviously, they wouldn't put them, they wouldn't say that they're indigenous or what what country they were from. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, I like when you said there was a lot of Spanish um, people in the yeah, first world war. First world war, <laughs> was amusing. Um, and the difficulties, of course, because people didn't didn't or couldn't identify themselves as being indigenous, and and the to look for these people must be very hard. What are the pointers when you're going through a file? Um, what are the pointers uh, other than a photo which, which might indicate to you that that person is Indigenous? What else do you look for? Place, oh, of, place, place, of, place of birth, place, place where they come from. Um, usually you'll find it's, it's where there was either a mission or there was um, some form, you know, so you can get an idea and you go, um, like those those women that I showed, two of those women or some of them, they all come from a place called Granite Downs. There is an Indigenous community there and, you know, it's a place in the middle of nowhere and it's a place to go from. So if you get people that say Sherberg, you go, Sherberg is a mission, you know, so Sherberg is a, is a done one. But what you start to find too is you will can look at some of those First World War names 
Um, and then you look at Second World War and the names pop up again in other services and, 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 all, and what happens after a while and you've done this for a while, you start to get this picture big overview picture and then there's tracks and you go oh hang on this this person's a cousin of this per you know and you you start to hook the names together and the places together um it's a lot of it's by guesswork um and then you've got to go out and talk to the people and say look i've heard this because the unfortunate thing when you're tracking these people down if if they're not dark and they don't look like an indigenous a lot of people and when i joined the navy i didn't say anything though other Indigenous members in the Navy, when I, you're a black fella, you know, yeah, yeah. But we always, there was a thing about, oh, you know, if, if you stick your hand up, um, there's a possibility it might go against you. So so we had a tendency to keep quiet um, and, and, and that makes it hard to do. So, and if you don't, and, and if you've said that you're Maori or you said you're um, from South Africa or you said you're from somewhere else, um, and that and families have lived the lie for a long time. That's the other hard one too. Is they they might not say they want to identify. Stolen generation makes it really hard. Um, there are there are other ways to find things too. Where where have I gone to the, some of the state um, indigenous agencies, and especially if you look at the Second World War and the First World War. Some of those agencies listed the men that went to serve or the women that went to serve. So they've actually got lists. So you know there is a list. And, uh, and so they're a really good resource to work on. Um, and there's a really good resource at the War Memorial in the 80s. A senator wrote all around Australia asking for ex-men serving members who'd served in the Australian Defence Force from World War I to about 19, to 19, 1980s. Um, and names pop up, and then you can use those names to link off to other people. Um, the good thing about it now is people are interested. 20 years ago, people were not interested or didn't want to, or went, oh, I'm Indigenous, but I don't want to stick my hand up now because I might I'm think people might think I want to get on the bandwagon and stuff. And um, that's the other thing is selling it as this is your history, be proud of it, tell me about it. What's happening now is people are telling us about it. Um, and I've been doing little interviews with current serving Indigenous members in the Air Force. And it's really interesting because one of the form, the form I give them that says, have you had a member serving in the Defence Force? You'd be surprised the amount of go, oh, dad served in Vietnam, granddad served in the Second World War, great granddad served in the First World War. There's, there's a long history of service. So there's lots of things that you can link to, and it just comes with doing it for a long time and getting the word out there to other people because some really good people out there who are Indigenous and non-Indigenous who are doing really good work on this and you're just talking to them. Well, I'm hoping, yeah. Gareth, that, yeah, well, I'm hoping Gareth, that, but that once the story gets out in the world, I know, yeah. I know um, the Air Force System Heritage, uh, as, as we were discussing, it's, we want to get you know, we want to get out there and find the story and also tell the story and to encourage people, as, as you say, to come forward and do yeah. About their proud Indigenous system and their, their lineage. And ladies and gentlemen, do we have any more questions from the floor? Yes, Michael. Uh, uh, Gary, great sure. talk, mate. I, I, I learned so much listening to that. So thank you so much. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, oh, I don't know where to start. Um, I, I, I noted reading about Len, mm. um, one of the things I read that he said that one of the areas that in his life that he experienced the least racism was when he was serving in the RAAF up in the yeah. islands. Can you confirm that? Yes, I can. And that's one of the really interesting things. What's come through all my research from the First World War to the present day is the least amount of racism that was, 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 was felt by people. Um, I came across two, two versions of it in... Um, and ever in, in the First World War, one of them actually was against Reg Saunders' dad who served in the First World War. And some soldier said, I'm not going to sit at the table with a black bastard. And they had a fight and they became the best of friends. Um, right. You know, and the next one, the next one was a guy, was two guys in Paris on leave in the First World War. And somebody had a go at them. Um, and a whole bunch of non-Indigenous Australian soldiers stood up for them and said, they're one of us. They're Australian soldiers. Go away. Um, and, that, and that's the thing. What I've found, too, all the way through this, too, is it's about trust. 
you got to trust the guy in the front end. And, and, and I, I, this comes up really heavily in the first of all, you've got to trust the guy in front of you and the guy behind you. When, when the bullets are flying, um, you know, you can't have any problems with a guy's sexual preference or his religious beliefs or the colour of his skin because you rely on him to save your life. I mean, and I was a submariner and, and I'll, I'll, you know, we had about five Indigenous guys on, on in the squadron at the time um, and you didn't see colour, you just saw this guy can do a job and he'll watch my back and he'll die for me if he has to. So it's that kind of a thing too. And one of the, one of the men that I interviewed in the Second World War <laughs> said to me, he said, when you're in the trenches and the bullets flying, and you look around you, you said, we're all a shitty shade of grey anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, colour seems to drain out of your face. So he yeah. said, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And, and that's what all what comes through all of this research work. The Australian Defence Force was an equal opportunity employer and still is. And it was an equal opportunity employer from day one, really. Um, and it wasn't so much the soldiers, it was government policy and military policy that, that could affect them. But you, you very rarely hear anything about how they have been badly treated while in uniform. Mm -hmm. and that's, the, and that's the good thing about the Defence Force. I, I just one more. I, I was. Uh, it, it's so disappointing what you said about the AWM not actually recognising some yep. of those indigenous, particularly the same. Is 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 there any pushback to that? Is there any uh, regret no to that at the moment? At the moment, they are looking at it. They're looking at the matter fairly. Um, they're looking at the Piri, and there's a couple of other people that were killed on service, serving with Australian forces, um, who weren't in the first forces proper. Um, they're they're not sure how to do it at, at the moment because. I pushed the matter fairly thing bloody 10 years ago when I was at the War Memorial. Um, what they found is too, with the, um, all the panels at the, uh, uh, up in the cloisters, to change one panel, you've got to change them all, move them along. So it, they found that oh. it, it, there, there is a cost problem, but, but I said, oh, that's a lot of rubbish. But what they've done too now is because they've basically gone to, if you're looking at all um, Afghanistan, Iraq, all of those things now, they're actually, they've got books now, so they put the names and things in books. So that the, the War Memorial is changing, it was changed under Brendan Nelson. Brendan Nelson said, well, I can't see why they can't be on the wall. Um, it's just it's a slow process thing um, to do. Um, and there is pushback by certain people. Oh, um, good. I yeah. hope it continues. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is pushback by certain people, and there's pushback by certain people on the War Board of Council, would you believe? Um, so, so it's um, you you are fighting some inner problems, but generally, the AWM believes that they should be up there. They should be recognised. They serve the nation. They, they serve the Australian Defence Force, and they and you know they pay the supreme sacrifice, and that's what it's all bloody about. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you for that, um, Larry and Michael. Uh, Gordon, you have a question. I, I do, I do. Um, thanks very much also, Gary. Um, great uh, talk again. And can I say decades and decades overdue, <laughs> but at least it's happening. Yes, I um, like it. Yes. Now, um, I, I wrote a book called This Smutty Squadron, which was all about 78 Squadron, mm. which is where Lead Waters served. Uh, actually, my old man served in the same squadron. No oh, wow. um, and um, I can just confirm what you're saying before uh, to Michael that when I interviewed some of the pilots, and this is you know 15 years ago now that I interviewed them. Unfortunately, Len was long since dead when, when I started my book. Um, but I said to him, you know, how did you feel about an Aboriginal man um, or First Nation mm -hmm. man serving in the in the squadron? And they said he would stop a bullet as quickly as we could. He was one of us. Yeah. Now, I noticed in your talk um, that you mentioned uh, that Len uh, flew 95 missions and then you mentioned the other guy flew 95 missions too. Yeah. I was just wondering where that comes from because in Len Waters' logbook, which I've got a copy of, yeah, it says 54 oh, missions. 54, yeah, yeah. I had that stuck in it from the other one. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Stuck in my mind. Yeah, yeah. 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 Fair yeah. enough. 
and that, and, and yeah, that, that that's that, that's the problem when you're doing this stuff all the time too. Stuff just rolls. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. the, that's not the only thing too, but because recently they opened up a um, a building in Williamtown and named the Len yep. Waters building. Yep. And they they mentioned there that he had did 95, 95. operations, which I is know, wrong it's, again. It's it's, a, it's wrong again, and that's the unfortunate thing. And because it's stuck in my mind, I use yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's yeah. and it's not wrong because I've seen his logbook. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's yeah. it. Uh, isn't, there, isn't there, wasn't there a question of which ones were operational, which were training? I think maybe they, they were, you know, all reconnaissance or perhaps. Or no, that, 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 in, in the logbook, it was just um, uh, he would he would distinguish between, he did 54 operations. Yeah. And, and if, he, if he did a formation flying, as they all did then, yeah. That was not considered an operational thing, yeah. Yeah. but it also oh. lists that he did uh, forty-one strike missions of those of those yeah. fifty-four, and I think what has happened in the past, because this is just a reasonably recent thing, that's saying that he did ninety-five missions, is they add the two together, which yeah. is wrong, because yeah. one the forty-one is just a subset of fifty-four. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very well, interesting because they've picked entries. Yeah. I think one of the telling yeah, that, stories about uh, about Len, uh, which I think really sums up a lot of what Gary's talking about, is is that you know he, he had five attempts to reset to, to get a uh, commercial pilot's license, and um, he couldn't get it. And then so I went back to his old um, his professional hearing, and uh, the the uh, who was in the in the shearing shed watching Len land on the moon, and that happened. And, um, one of the guys said, I wonder how that happens. How do they manage that? And Len described it all to them. They said, you know, like the theory of flight and all that sort of stuff. And um, they said, how do you know that? I said, I flew to you. Know? And Sorry, I your audio dropped out then. Oh, did it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. He, was, he was saying that, um, that the guys asked him, you know, how, did that, how did they manage that? How did they get a man to land on the moon? And he said, um, and explained how to them. The theory of flight and that sort of thing. How did you know that? And they said, and he said, because I flew. I flew during the second war. So I think that kind of that story sums everything up. You know, that he couldn't. He, he, yes, he went in there. He, he was. He was equal. Um, he was treated equally. But after the war, that was not to be. Very sad. Yeah. It is. Just yeah. just on that that story too about him um, trying to get in. Um, to the war, because I know um, uh, Peter Rees covers it in his book, um, The Missing Man, which I think is a great title for that book, Perfect. fantastic yeah. title. Yeah. Um, but um, Len wasn't the only person discriminated against, the non-Indigenous people were discriminated against, even from the same squadron. Mm. Um, and I've got, um, I interviewed quite a few pilots, um, one who pops to mind because I'm just writing a bit of a biography at the moment is Bill Henry. He was given the same excuse. He tried to, like Liam, tried to join commercial, and the reply was, um, you, "You don't have multi-engine experience. You only flew single-engine aircraft fighters." Mm -hmm. And of course, they had this multitude, almost a plague of bomb command pilots and yeah. air bomber pilots everywhere coming in, and they could just pick and choose amongst them even. And even I remember talking with Bobby Gibbs years ago, and he said the same thing. He said, "Ah." Oh, I said to him, why just go to bloody New Guinea after the water, start an airline? And he said, because they couldn't get a job down here with the airlines. Yeah. Because he had a single engine, only single engine fighter pilot. They're all on the same boat, unfortunately. Well, mm. uh, do we have any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And on behalf of the History and Heritage Branch, um, really do appreciate that, that the more that I hear about Indigenous service, the more I think, what, you know, I mean, Gary and I were only talking the other day and I was saying, you know, I've had, I've had many, many years of service and I look back and I think of, I think I know that person who was Indigenous, was a lady on my, you know, was first posted to Laverton and, and, she, and she went back actually after six years of service to go back to her community and Gary was saying the other day, he thinks he knows who she is, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Hope to be able to contact her. And then there was a there was a chap that I worked with um ship put out after his commission. But I, I didn't know of too many indigenous people. And of course, I'd probably be all the time, you know. 
um, would, would, would never say that. You know, for all the obvious reasons of, oh, well, I don't want to be held back, I don't want to be hit by bandwagon, or whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's great that we're getting out there and telling the story, as we should with, you know, with, with uh, something like 121 nations and representing them to get out and get their speech. And why would someone, someone you know, from, from a European country come out here to Australia and decide to try to focus on the motivation? So look, on behalf of, um, of um, uh, the, the Friends of History and Heritage Branch, Gary, um, it's great working with you. And um, uh, I hope I've got around your desk too much of all those secret, <laughs> secret men's business. Secret men's business. As much as all of I'd love to. I'd love to know. <laughs> I'd have to kill you if you read that stuff. That's right, exactly. <laughs> I'll follow myself on the secret women's business. So, yeah. So, yeah. anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We've got another um, another uh, terrific presenter lined up for uh, for next um, month for September. And um, so, uh, if that's if there's nothing further, I'll, I'll uh, bid you all adieu. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Gary. Well, yeah. I, what's what's the indigenous in your language, Gary, for goodbye? That's what I should See ya. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh.